Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. I'm joined by Josh Castor. Hello. James Kerkelis. Hello, everyone. Emily Spiria. Hello. And guest starring uh, Tom Benavides. Hi, all. Who was on uh, our last show. Um, this week, we're going to be uh, going over the two hour uh, discussion of the Better Bus Project, um, guest starring our state senator Michael Barrett. Um, we're going to go over the front page story of the Boston Globe, um, which had our, uh, our housing representatives na name John Gollander first first words on the front page of Boston Globe um, uh, us, with us in hot water. Um, and also we're going to talk about the Lexington power plant that's a, that abuts Waltham that people are uh, are very concerned about on the internet. Um, so we're gonna start with the Better Bus Project conversation, which is winding down. Um, we've been talking a lot about that in the past few debriefs, but there really can't be that many more discussions on this, uh, this particular project because those changes are coming. Um, and so let's, what I guess what I'll do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what has been said in the past and a little about what we've talked about. Um, and then I'll give it over to uh, the rest of the team here to give their takes. So Better Bus Project is MBTA rerouting some of the um, Bus lines um, in, in Waltham, some go more often, like the 70, uh, is, goes from 45 minutes uh, on the Carter Street uh, commuter rail station to every 15 minutes, which for, for me, that's freaking awesome. I love that. Um, but as you uh, go more north, uh, a lot of the bus lines are either cut or rerouted uh, towards Market Basket. Um, the Ward 3 City Councilor, George Darcy, who uh, represents a lot of North Waltham, he uh, is not very pleased about this. Uh, he is trying to make as much noise as possible um, to, to the MBTA, trying to get them to backpedal these decisions. Um, the most, uh, I think, effective way that he's doing this is he's trying to get the Waltham City Council to sign a letter uh, and uh, send it off saying that they oppose these things, um, which would make the city council uh, be on the record. Um, they can give him the floor all he wants, but uh, this letter would mean that they all um, are in agreement. Um, and so that has forced a very large conversation to happen. Um, Senator Michael Barrett was here. Uh, Tom Stanley uh, took the floor with his state rep hat on instead of the city council. Uh, the mayor was there, spoke uh, several times, um, talking about what could be done and if this is even uh, worthwhile. Uh, we saw some councilors disagreeing with George Darcy, saying that they didn't believe that North Waltham had enough bus uh, attendance uh, to make this worthwhile. Some councilors were hoping to get more data from uh, the MBTA, um, but the ever looming problem is that some of these changes are happening in two weeks. Um, and so a large discussion was, what do you do moving forward? A lot of what Michael Bear was talking about was, what do you do moving forward with these changes? One of the things that was, I guess the, the way the exchange kind of went with uh, Michael Barrett when, when he was getting questioned by like the counselors, like I believe it was Randy who sort of, who sort of bluntly put it like, why is Waltham getting screwed by this? And he kind of pointed out that this reflects like current ridership, like where where the current sort of density of riders are, mm -hmm. and that like a lot of communities are making out ahead from this, and that it's a, and actually then pointed out that they should just work with like existing bus services in the city and try to like make what they can work with grants internally. So I mm -hmm. thought that was an interesting response. Yeah, I mean, a large discussion was the idea of using data. Uh, there was a lot of talk about, like, what does the data say? Michael Barrett brought up the fact that the big winners, uh, quote unquote, of the Better Bus Project, they came to all of their meetings very organized. Uh, the, the, the cities came to the 
MBTA meetings very organized with data to support what they wanted. Um, and and no, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. What what be, what becomes harder is how do you put into numbers qualitative data that says working class people need this in certain neighborhoods in North Waltham. And I think that's what George is attempting to say over and over again, is there might not be a lot of attendance in these neighborhoods, but you know it's a very important for those people in those neighborhoods that these buses exist. And data just doesn't support that. And that's really tough for, for George and for the for those people that are there. Um, and you can't, it's really hard to prove that that should exist when you've got people in the MBTA bleeding, hemorrhaging money, they need to do something. And the data suggests cutting those, cutting those lines. Yeah. And I've kind of consistently been in, against the grain in the sense that like, I think the entire premise that the city councilors are working on is wrong in the sense that I think they're so blind going to this. I don't think any of them truly actually ever ride the bus or mm -hmm. know how the bus works. Or have you really even looked very hard at the bus network redesign with Darcy accepted? He's the only one who seems like show any actual, like truly caring about this. Um, but if you look at the data and look at the redesign, Waltham is one of the big winners in aggregate. There are, of course, like North Waltham continues to be shafted to the same degree they have always been. Um, but across and like the there is like a now like less bus service between Market Basket and and Waltham Common, which is very large. But for every other part of Waltham, it continues to have increased service. We are going to have significantly more buses running through Waltham after this redesign than we had before. Like by every single metric, by like how many people are going to be able to ride the bus in Waltham, how reliable it's going to be, how frequent it's going to be coming, on what days, at what hours the bus is going to be coming, on every single one of those metrics. There are going to be there is going to be more bus surface in Waltham, but because none of these counselors ride the bus or have cared to look into that, like how this bus network redesign affects Waltham in a critical way at all, they are completely oblivious to this. And that for me is my biggest thing about it. Like what a good bus network looks like is and what the MBTA's goal was is for us to have across the Boston area to have higher frequency service across more ranges of the day in the places where people ride the bus. And that is exactly what Waltham gets out of this bus network redesign. Like by any by any metric, Waltham is why by any metric except for spatial coverage because of the lack of service in North Waltham, Waltham in every other way is a big winner out of this redesign. And none of the counselors seem to be aware of that, or if they are aware of that, they don't want to acknowledge it. Which is mainly concerning because like I'm not against us raising hell about you know wanting more service, especially for North Waltham. But at the end of the day, what we should be advocating for is for good bus service. And what we are getting is the good bus service. But because none of our city councilors or the mayor know what good bus service looks like, none of them are aware of that. You mm -hmm. had um we had texted a little bit and you had done some metrics uh, on strictly numbers and percentage wise, I thought it was interesting. I don't, I don't wanna try to quote you. Do you have those numbers in front of you about- uh, I do have to decide if you would yeah. like. Yeah, so I did a street by street analysis of basically each segment of bus wall, uh, each segment of bus routes in Waltham, where a service is being gained, where a service is being lost, both during the weekdays and during the weekends. So, we can see like in these links here, we can access like what the old bus map looked like. So Waltham is way over here. It's kind of, you know, low resolution. We also have what the new bus route looks like. Yeah, this is what the new bus route looks like in Waltham. And when I've done this map, I basically just overlay them with each other. So all these red routes, these are places where we used to have bus service and we no longer have bus service. These dark blue routes are where we used to have bus service and we will still have bus service after the bus network redesign. And this light blue segment right here and this light blue segment way down here is where uh, we are going to have new service. There was not service there before. So as you can see, comparing the light blue routes from the red routes, like there is less spatial coverage with this bus network redesign. 
you know, we are losing out on a couple of bus corridors. But when we look at the number of routes being run through each of these routes, during the weekdays, there is going to be a 50% increase in bus service, like in aggregate, simply because, uh, like, especially like on this bus route, which goes through Bentley from Waltham Common to Waverly to Arlington, that's changing from what used to be or is currently five times a day, it's going to be close to 20 times a day. Uh, this segment right here, which goes from Central Square to, Water, uh, to Watertown to Cambridge, that's going, I forget the exact numbers, it's going from roughly uh, 80 times a day to 116 times a day. Uh, and I've done this on a segment by segment basis. So you can see that, okay, uh, in North Waltham, we're getting slightly increased service. Um, some places we're getting service eliminated, some places we're getting new service. But especially it is in these places, it's the eastern half of Waltham where a lot of the new frequency is um, centered. So like this D segment, this F segment, this K segment, this M segment, bus service is increasing 200%, 50%, 100%. And the important things are is that this is a, this is the parts of Waltham where there is dense multifamily housing. This is where a large, a significant more majority of the transit riding population of Waltham lives. So there's just going to be a lot more of it. And additionally, like weekend service just increased across the board because there was almost no weekend service in Waltham before this beyond the 70 bus. And now is just going to be all across Waltham. People will no longer, uh, transit dependent residents all across Waltham will no longer be stuck in their homes on the weekends. That's awesome. What you, this five minutes that you just talked about was so much more informative than the hours and hours and hours spent on this. And it was way more, you're talking about counselors not being informed. Yeah, they, I guess they, what you just said is so much more informative than what they just said. Um, and that goes back to kind of what Michael Barrett was talking about, um, about moving steps moving forward, about he, he was acknowledging like these changes are going to happen, although he did mention that some of them aren't going to happen until 2028, which I was confused by, and I'm not sure which are going to do that. Um, but he was just like, you guys just need to start fostering that relationship with the MBTA. You need to start, you know, refining who's going to be showing up to these meetings and what you're going to say. And he's 100% correct. And George, you know, hats off to him for, you know, standing up for his constituents but life is all about organizing. It's all about how organized you are for the things that you want. And Waltham is not organized for public transit. It's not something that Waltham champions. And if we can pretend like we care for two months during Committee of the Whole, uh, but what's going to happen after those two months? We need to, if Waltham wants better public transit, it needs to get organized in that way. Um, and I, and also I would like to say, I really don't see that happening with the current city council at all. Um, I can say that I want them to do that, but I truly am not, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. But I think what, what I'm trying to say is that I hope that a new city council, uh, is born, uh, and from the ashes, uh, a champion of public transportation, uh, occurs. It sounds like even though the new, um, the better bus plan goes into effect, really soon. Um, it sounds like there still is room for negotiation. And even I was watching video of a November 2nd Better Bus Project um, meeting. It was a public meeting via Zoom. And, um, and a, a representative of the MBTA Better Bus Project even said, we certainly expect to have to work with cities, towns, states, across the region to make adjustments for these new bus movements. So um, as recently as that, they were expecting to have to make changes. So it sounds like it's done, but it's, you know, I guess they update, they were also saying um, in the meeting, um, I don't remember if it was Senator Barrett um, saying that they update the bus routes periodically um, as a matter of course, um, so that there will still be opportunities to look at these issues. And, um, you know, so I think there's a general sense that the passion for representing constituents is appreciated, but 
just kind of like keep that passion up because there'll still be opportunities, you know, ongoing to meet the needs public transportation wise. And there were definitely some counselors, I don't know if it's just a you know political thing to say, but uh, there were some that were saying that this isn't a done deal. Tom Stanley, even our state rep uh, in his state rep hat, was saying he didn't think this was over and that he thinks that there are still things to be done. I just disagree. I mean, maybe that's true. Uh, I just really don't see it happening, especially the MBTA. I mean, like I said, we're not, Waltham is not organized in a way that we champion buses. We can send a letter. Even if like we don't, we haven't even sent the letter. We can't even agree on sending the letter, and uh, to be able to change MTA's mind, I think it's going to take more than that. And we can't even agree to send the letter, which is also mm -hmm. spoiling, I guess, guess the end of that meeting. Uh, but we're we're asking for more data um, from from the MBTA, which is hilarious because they were talking about, oh, I wish wish the MBTA had told us uh, like why they're cutting these lines. But if they had just gone to any of the meetings they were invited to uh, throughout the months of the Better Bus Project, they would have they would have knew those answers. And uh, just to speak up to clarify uh, the timeline, uh, the website of the Better Bus Project and the MBTA bus network redesign says that changes will be rolled out in the summer of 2023 specifically. So it may be a bit longer till we see it. Uh, the dates for the rollout technically goes all the way to 2028 don't know um, what exactly that means. Uh, but to elaborate on what Emily said uh, and what uh, Senator Barrett said, uh, yeah, every spring and every fall, the MBTA sends out an updated bus map with uh, slight alterations to the route every spring, every fall. Uh, that's their iteration process. Tom, thank you for making the um, analysis. That was really cool. And I had a question about it, if you don't mind putting your map back up. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, I, this is just a great example of how, you know, discussions can be very different when you're looking at data and, and, and charts than when you're in a meeting having people come in to talk on things. Because in a meeting, people put a lot of weight on personal experience. So if someone's there who's going to be impacted, they have more weight than the 10 people who aren't there, even though they're impacted too. Um, but there's also this kind of idea that if you're analyzing something with numbers the way you are, that there's going to be some kind of humanity and common sense that gets missed. So my question is about, if you look at the boxes that you have labeled 31, 32, 40, 41, 49, 50, they, are they now have the 70A bus or whatever. It's, sorry, it's not called that anymore, but they currently have that bus that comes up through that's going away. And on the map though, it looks like they're really close to this new bus that's going in on the other side of the highway. So if you were just going by like how many people and how far they had to walk, it might look like um, not much of a trade-off, but the thing is there's a, a hill, there's Prospect Hill, and there's um, a highway in between. So somebody is currently taking that bus um, that bus line that's marked B is pretty much totally losing access. They don't really have the option to just walk over to that new line. So is that the kind of thing that you think can get missed in a quantitative analysis? Or do you think um, I'm just, uh, you know, biased because this is something that affects me, so it stands out to me? No, I think that's a 100% uh, valid thing to raise, and it's something that does need to be raised whenever you're doing quantitative analysis analyses. Um, one thing that I should bring up is that there are lots of ways I could have chosen uh, to represent how bus service changes over time. The reason I chose to split it up into segments is because, um, specifically because of our discussions in the last call we had. Uh, where you mentioned how you're going to have less service getting from the market basket area to um, to Waltham Common, mm -hmm. so that that meant I ended up wanting to split up between like the G and H segment on that segment of, of Main Street. So that way, it would be obvious when looking at this data that the service on that segment would be cut in half because of that. Um, so it is definitely very important to raise those points to make sure that they aren't being missed. In, in the data an analytics, because that is very much true. Uh, the lived experiences 
of people who actually live with these bus routes can be very affected depending upon what metrics are used when folks do their data analysis. Uh, so making sure you are always speaking up, giving your feedback to the MBTA whenever they send out those surveys. That is the way they make sure that they aren't myth skipping over anything. They read a letter, they see, okay, this is your lived experience. Let's make sure our data actually represents that and you aren't falling through the cracks. Um, so you're definitely right to believe that that is true. And that is why advocacy and always speaking up and replying to surveys and letters is always important. Thank you. And can we get this uh, a link to this to put um, up with the, uh, this report? Because I think people want to check it out for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be sure to share that. Thank you. Um, something else, uh, George Darcy started the meeting by saying the winner of the Better Bus Project is Market Basket. Um, and he's, uh, while that was whimsical and funny, is also very true. Uh, Market Basket is becoming a hub or a node um, it, based on these projections. And I think the MBTA is, uh, is correct in assuming that, uh, I don't know if Market Basket lobbied the MBTA, but it certainly looks like that. But um, you've got the 128 development that's just going to cripple that intersection. We've talked about that before. Um, it, and you've got dispensaries coming up. Um, and so we, we often talk about, you know, I'm just gonna share my screen, just bring up Google Maps. Um, just this whole area, uh, around Market Basket is just going to be so developed in the in the next few years. Uh, um, and we talk all about it. I, I think in 10 years, when people think of Waltham, they'll think about this development just as much as they think about Moody Street. There's going to be so much going on here. Uh, and now there will be easy to get easier to get to um, with with the MBTA. Um, the only thing that's gonna suck is getting there by car <laughs> because that is just going to be a nightmare. Our own traffic uh, commission uh, admits that it's going to be rated an F and it's currently rated a D. Currently we're going to be rated an F after all that development and there's basically no mitigation plan uh, in place right now. Nothing to make that easier. Um, so huge, 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 huge development. Uh, now we'll have more buses going there. Great. Um, in 10 years, I think people will definitely be going to Waltham to go there and just as much, if not more, than uh, Moody Street uh, prediction. So there is a bit of a traffic mitigation plan, even though the dispensaries, um, the traffic studies they contributed to didn't show they were going to contribute significantly to the traffic. Um, the city did decide to go ahead and allocate the community impact fees they'll be paying into to traffic mitigation. And there are some specific projects that have been um, sort of lined up for that. So there is some, some plan when it comes to Bear Hill Road and the intersection there. Um, That's good. So you don't know that. That's good. I hope um, that whatever traffic mitigation that does happen doesn't turn Main Street into more of a highway. Yeah, I want to say this does Boiler not alert. optimistic to me just because, um, I mean, A, it's you're building on a highway. It's going to be heavily polluted, especially if you end up building residence, residences there. It's going to be very bad for people's long-term health. Um, no one's going to be walking across a highway. It is going to just lead to more car dependency. It's just going to lead to more pollution, more people driving to get there. So turning my ancient highway. This sounds like a bad development pattern from my amateur opinion, but. Uh. Well, there's a lot um, we need to look into about the 1065, 1265, sorry, 1265 Main Street project. So another thing that happened this week, but I didn't get enough info on it to say in the headlines, but Councillor Cates and some people from Ward 7 organized a protest against a development that, if I understand correctly, is part of the broader 1265 project and it's a building that's going to be taller than other buildings in the neighborhood they're asking um, for a variance for that and so they did a protest where they had balloons put up to show the height of it and um, it 
seems like maybe a NIMBY thing in a way, like they're just focused on what's near them, but there is this bigger issue going on where I guess the 1265 developers has made certain promises about what they're putting in and the city doesn't have control over the timeline though. So this kind of came up when talking about the pot shops and their traffic is basically the, um, the council wanted the pot shops to pay to fix the traffic they were going to cause and the traffic engineers basically said what they're doing is minimal compared to what this 1265 project is going impact it's going to have um so i think we want to try to learn more about that for future shows because maybe it is um a good strategy on the part of the ward seven folks to say look you we need to know the order things are being done on this project um be so that we know that the things you've agreed to do to mitigate traffic and mitigate other problems are actually happening when the traffic is happening. So I don't see how you can mitigate. I don't know. I They're like put in a certain pot. They, they have the pot shops put in money for mitigation, but it's not like you can get a certain amount of mitigation for any amount of money. Like you, ha you have to plan things out and build bridges and build things, right? There's not like little... Or maybe I'm wrong, but there aren't like small piecemeal things you can do to fix traffic on the street. I think maybe the counselors think there are like there's smart traffic lights. I don't know what. <laughs> that would be very convenient if there was, I think. Yeah, I think so. Those are the types of solutions they're, solutions they're looking at. We could transition to the, to the thing about the losing the funding for not doing development around like the MBTA area, but this is all kind of related, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the issue with traffic is trip generation. And if people just live next to where most of the amenities that they need to access are, you're not going to have them need to use a car to get to them. So if there's going to be a traffic issue, maybe not have it be primarily accessible by car. And that's where having this is like an MBTA hub, I think kind of runs directly counter to it, having also this new uh interchange or, or highway off ramp there too so i i don't know how that would actually is actually going to play out but it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere good <laughs> the other maybe it seems to me problem with having market pass as, as a hub is it's on top of a hill so everybody who has to walk there as the beginning or end of their commute is walking uphill or downhill maybe there's no better option i don't know but that that doesn't seem ideal i bike up that hill every morning uh, to work at Starbucks, it sucks. There uh, are people who have to do their groceries on foot and go up that yeah, hill. No, I see them all. Groceries. Time. Yeah, yeah, sucks. Sorry, Tom. What did you say? I just said I don't know how you do it. I'm too scared to bike that road. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. When we talk about critical mass folk and like you know what people are comfortable with, all I think about is like cars whiz by me one millimeter away every day, friggin' on Main Street. Like, damn, I've gotten way too used to 50 ton trucks really, really close to my body. Um, something else that came from this discussion we've talked about on the show was the idea of a municipal bus service, the idea of uh, Waltham filling in the gaps that MBTA does not. Um, it was almost brought up in like a like a kind of tongue in cheek way uh, the first time George talked about it, but um, it's now being talked about the mayor's saying that she's totally open to the idea, uh, the mayor of Waltham. Um, we talked, they were talking about uh, in the past, Bentley and Brandeis urging them to work together uh, on their shuttles, uh, getting nowhere, but the idea of doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I would really, really, really like to see uh, Waltham just join what our neighbors are already doing um, and just looking at where services could be increased or created and then just do it ourselves. Uh, it's not a radical idea. It's not, it wouldn't even be that difficult. Um, and I'm glad people are talking about it. Even the mayor of Waltham seems to be on board with it. I think what I like hearing about that too is the pointing out that like they don't even plan would, would not even be running those things with fares because it doesn't make sense to and to just run the routes that make sense based on mm -hmm. like what what it, where it is useful right and then from there that actually gives you a place to collect data for getting the NBA the MBTA to get involved so it just seems like it's too obvious to not pursue at this point. Mm. 
Um, the only final point I also had uh, was when Tom Stanley was talking, which this is a great example of uh, of worst person you know making a good point um, about how he you know he wants people to show up to these meetings. He went to uh, some better bus project meetings. Um, but he was lamenting the fact that none of the people came and he's older. So, uh, you know, the internet is not really his thing. And he, all, all he was talking about was the lack of a newspaper and like him sending out emails, but like, he, he's just frustrated with the lack of outreach. Um, and we could, I could talk a lot about how he has so many more resources at his disposal uh, and with the municipality that he could be using that he's not using. But from an organizing standpoint, I, I do agree with him that there's not as much uh, to communicate to residents of Waltham with. You know, I do a lot of organizing online, but that is such a small percentage of Waltham residents. We're a city of 68,000 people. Uh, you know, I can make a Facebook post that reaches 200 and I feel good about it, but that's, you know, a very, 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 very small echo chamber of people. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I agree with Tom that it would, uh, it's difficult to get organized to become that champion of uh, public tra uh, transit without more avenues of uh, outreach. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Tom for coming on again uh, and the very, very informative uh, spiel about what this actually means for Waltham, which did a better job than five hours of uh, Committee of the Whole meetings. Yeah, so thank you, Tom, for coming on. Um, you are welcome to stick around to chat about these next two subjects, but if not, uh, thank you for coming on. So a Boston Globe article was recently released uh, talking about how Waltham is in hot water joining other communities because we did not do something we should have done. Josh is going to explain more. I have a very short anecdote about me realizing this stuff. So people were sharing the article and I thought that was very interesting. Um, but I was at the uh, Waltham Community Leadership Group on Tuesday and they were passing around the Boston Globe and I realized it was the front page. It was literally like the first article on the right. And it's just talking about Waltham just failing as a municipality to address dense housing. Um, and so it does not make us look good. But Josh, please explain what this means. Yeah, so uh, we've actually talked about this new law on our show. Uh, Christine Mackin actually brought it up way back when I interviewed her at the beginning of the year. It was one of our first Channel 781 interviews as something that was coming down the pipeline that the city council would need to deal with this year. It's a state law that was passed last year and it requires communities that are on the T to allow more denser housing near the T. And in what that means changing zoning laws, which means it would presumably require action by the city council. And as far as we know, there has been no action by the city council Council this year. It hasn't been discussed in any of their meetings uh, it, unless it was in one that we missed. So the article was about there was a deadline that Waltham missed to submit um, a plan for how we're going to comply with the law. And apparently we were one of eight communities that missed the deadline. So the state agency that's in charge of enforcing this sent letters to the housing authorities in each of these um, communities, including Waltham, warning them that they're going to lose out on money because they're out of compliance. And normally the housing authority wouldn't be involved in this. This, this has to do with, you know, City Hall and the City Council. But um, this was, it appears this was a tactic, maybe a very smart tactic that the state office took um, to make people aware of the fact that their city was not in compliance. So they sent him a warning saying that they could lose $300,000. The Globe quoted the executive director of Waltham Housing Authority as saying this will have a very significant impact on his residents who are many of whom are disabled or elderly or very low income that he might have to just not do certain repairs if something's broken it might not get fixed. So this is a big deal and it was on the front page of the Globe and the um, headlines, the article's been posted places, and a lot of the comments on it seem like people are kind of assuming this was a clerical snafu, um, like the train horns, or, or at least what the train horns were perceived to be. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, from what we've been following, it doesn't look that way. It looks like um, the mayor and maybe certain city councilors, we don't know who's 
discussed this behind the scenes, made a plan to ignore this law um, and just eat um, the losses. And the reason I say that was first way back in January when Christine told us about that, she said that and she had heard Newton and certain other communities were openly considering that. Um, ignoring the law. And to give a little background about this idea of ignoring a law, so um, most the 40B, most people know 40B as a type of housing, right? But 40B is a law that was passed in 1969, and what it actually does is requires every city and town to have a certain percentage of affordable housing. And many cities and towns, including Waltham, are still not in compliance with it decades later. Um, and so it's the, for enforcement, the way they, the penalty they set up is that if you're not in compliance, a developer can come in who wants to do affordable housing and they can bypass your whole zoning process. They can go ahead and build without the town's permission. So is the idea behind the law was that would be, that would motivate cities and towns to make a plan to build the kind of affordable housing that would work for their community. Because if they didn't, developers were going to come in and build something they didn't like, but that hasn't worked. Um, there are still many, many cities and towns that are not in compliance, and that's largely because there are a lot of ways that cities and towns can avoid having those 40B projects come in, and we've seen some examples of that this year in Waltham. So I think maybe from the mayor's point of view, from the city's point of view, this seems like a, a, you know, a reasonable option to just ignore a state law and eat the losses, like a business decision. But it's kind of interesting, you know, because when an individual breaks the law, <laughs> they usually have pretty severe consequences and people, you know, the public doesn't usually side with them, but this, we're talking about um, the city breaking the law. So it'll be interesting to see how the public reacts. And what's amazing to me is the mayor was not quoted in the article. The article said that no one in Waltham returned their calls who they contacted. And that's really remarkable. I don't know where our, our viewers work. If you work at a company, if you work at a, government, if you work at a university, if your institution is on the front page of the globe with something negative, an email goes out from the head of your institution within 24 hours telling the community, you know, here's what we, here's our side of the story. And it's amazing to me the mayor hasn't done that. Um, there's been no official response. People can just assume this was a clerical snafu. They can think it was a good idea for the town to ignore it or not, but she hasn't said. And actually, I want to go to James because there's one piece of info I don't have on this because I didn't watch the Better Bus meeting, but apparently the, the mayor may, did make she hasn't made any public comment on this that I know of, except she did make a comment related to it at the bus meeting. Yeah, well, and we'll have to clip this, but she did specifically try to spin what was happening as the state taking money away from poor people in a vacuum without like any, like in about as many words. What I feel about all of this is, this is the same method that's going on in the state. For example, we've been asked to have about another 4,000 units of multifamily housing in the downtown because it's right next to the rail, but there's no increase in the rail. So if we don't do that, they take the money away from the poor people in the Waltham Housing Authority, which is what they've done. And I mean, she's a lawyer, so it kind of comes across that like she's she's spinning in that way, but it, it's so if her it, position. It, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say this is you'd mentioned how they kind of go about fighting 40B development. And we talked about this in our last meeting, how these developments end up in a much higher tax bracket as a result of developing in Waltham. Like that's sort of how they go about the uh it's a, it's sort of roundabout, but it sort of creates the terrain where it's less advantageous to pursue 40B development in Waltham relative to other places. And then that probably goes a pretty long way to explain why we have such a lack of housing here relative to like the transit that's being sort of set up as a result of the bus plan. Yeah, I mean, if her position is that this is a bad law and, uh, you know, it's a legit decision for our city to ignore it because it's a bad law and but we're gonna you know lose some money and that's okay 
why wouldn't you have somebody writing up a statement that said that back in January when you'd made the decision to handle it this way? That's what's amazing to me is that there's no public response except this offhanded comment. And if she really feels that way, that this is that the state is being a bully by, you know, taking money away from poor people to enforce a bad law, why not say so in a in a persuasive way to the public? I don't understand her strategy of remaining silent on things like this. And I think it's it's not a good strategy. I think it's going to hurt her going into next year's election. But the other question here is, what have the city councilors discussed or not discussed about this? Because in order to comply, they would have to be involved, probably. They would need to change zoning. So if it hasn't come up in city council, either... It may be because the legal department or someone in City Hall told them it didn't need to be brought up. Maybe they looked at it and said, we don't think we need to do anything. I don't know what happened here if they understood that they were, by not acting on this, they would have this consequence for the housing authority or if they had a different impression of what the consequences would be. In in her mention of you know, the, the poor being like robbed of this money, you know, she said that that they they were expecting the city to increase housing but without an increase of service like mbta service so i thought that was interesting i i'm wondering if she's asked for um an increase in commuter rail or if she's referring to bus service and whether there's been some kind of expectation or negotiation that in return for complying with um increasing the housing, that there is some increase in service. Um, and that's why she hasn't complied. But it was um, an interesting, somewhat sounding off, off the cuff sounding comment. Yeah, so I think I can elaborate a little bit on this. So the way the MBTA communities law works is that different municipalities have different requirements for how much housing they're expected to build depending upon what level of transit access they have. So for those communities which have access to the red line, green line, blue line, what they refer to as rapid transit, they have the highest requirement of how much housing they need to zone for and how dense it needs to be. Next up on the list is those which are commuter rail communities, those which have commuter rail stations. That is what we all fall under. So the reason we have our specific housing burden is because we have a commuter rail station or two commuter rail stations in our municipality. And then the third type of community is just an MBTA adjacent community. That's if your municipality is next to another municipality that has a commuter rail station. So what the mayor was trying to do is she was trying to say, oh, we have this obligation to zone for housing because we have this commuter rail station. But if that's the case, why aren't they improving our commuter rail service? Why aren't they increasing commuter rail? This is a very illegitimate form of argument. I do not respect it. She is definitely grasping at straws, but that is what she was trying to say in order to absolve herself of responsibility. I'm going to verbally say, though, this is illegitimate. She is trying to make excuses. But that is, that is the that, that was how I interpreted it as well. It's yeah. very much like the, the complaint of uh, complaining about the traffic every time there's a new development when you're the person in charge of how much, like, how pedestrian friendly things are and how much traffic there's ultimately going to be it's yeah and if i may continue on a little bit more um the day after or two days after this meeting yesterday morning i was in a meeting with the west metro home consortium uh which is a group of uh cities or an organization that works with cities in the west metro boston area waltham included in order to advocate and fund um, affordable housing, like just making sure that low income and housing insecure residents gain secure housing. Um, and they were discussing how Waltham is one of the top three um, worst cities. I say worst. It is one of the three cities which has the highest level of, home, of homelessness uh, and worst housing insecurity. And this case manager came into the meeting. His name was uh, Brent Rourke. And he came here and he talked about how the worst problem in Waltham, like the reason it's so hard to get people housing when their housing is secure is that they have the money, they have the vouchers, they have the subsidies in order to get these people housing. The number one problem in Waltham for him in trying to get people housing is that there is no supply 
like they're straight up he has a section 8 voucher but there just aren't any housing units around for him to supply these people with um yeah. it's so scarce that he has to go through um real estate agents in order to hook him up with like these this very scarce resource but that just adds another fee on top of these costs that this low-income resident of Waltham has to pay. Um, so that's what makes me particularly incensed about the mayor's refusal to go along with the MBTA community's law, because it is a one-two punch and just totally betraying our low-income and housing insecure residents, where A, she is not increasing the housing supply. You know, there is a law for inclusive zoning in Waltham where what this MBTA community law requires is that MB is Waltham zones for 4,000 more housing units. This will include at least at minimum 800 income restricted affordable housing units because of existing Waltham laws. So in refusing to go along with this, she is both A, not allowing Waltham to have more um, affordable housing, which is our most scarce resource and the biggest impediment towards housing our housing secure population. And then there's the second punch of also because of her refusal to do this, losing $300,000 for the Waltham Housing Authority and therefore preventing us from further maintaining our existing affordable housing stock. It is a horrible decision, like in all manners of the term. And just like, I don't know, I'm very mad about this, but it's a total betrayal of like all of our low income and housing insecure residents in Waltham. Just a second, but you can see echoes of like the poor decision making at play here with like the, with the, way that they handled like the pod shops and stuff too where they dragged their feet from the time when it was approved until like it's basically undeniable they need to do something and all that that nets is them losing all the money that they could have been making in the meantime and like gaining four thousand extra residents is not like peanuts you know in terms of like what that brings to a city so it's just like very short-sighted and just very myopic in my opinion we talked a lot about is Waltham going to become a champion of public transportation? And we're basically just giving a huge middle finger to not only the MBTA, but to our low-income residents and also anyone that was thinking about the idea of living closer to the commuter rail. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's all part of a larger conversation of what is the future of Waltham? What, what is it going to look like? Is it going to be denser? Is it not? Are we going to become a champion of single-family zoning? 4,000. I didn't know, Tom, thank you for that background. I didn't know the number was 4,000. And that must sound really scary to some of our city councilors, because I remember there was a speech um, Councilor McMenamin made last year where she went through the history of the town since she'd been here, and the population had only grown by two or 3,000. And, and the point of her, her, her speech was that was too much, basically. So when they're hearing 4,000 more units, I, my guess is with someone with that perspective, like Councilor McMenamin has, when they're hearing 4,000 units, they're probably thinking, no way, that's never happening. We're never doing that. So in that, it's not that surprising that it hasn't gotten done yet. Waltham, while having 60,000 residents, 25,000 homes, has 90,000 jobs in its borders. Um, the mayor and city councilor have been very greedy in bringing in new developments, bring, bringing in more jobs, bringing in more businesses that they can like squeeze tax money out of. Uh, it is only in housing that they have been standing their ground and being like, oh, no, no, we can't have that. Um, and that is part of what has led to Waltham having this insane housing crunch where we have like absolutely like tragically high unhoused population numbers and ridiculously high rents for the area. Third highest statewide at this point. Yeah, third highest rent statewide, yeah. Of any city or town? Boston, Cambridge, Waltham. Are you serious? How can that be? May Mayor McCarthy's mission accomplished. <laughs> we are very fancy people. We need monocles. We <laughs> we've, already, we've already got people having to go to the New third to most expensive drugs. town. Mm -hmm. It's a good and, deal for property owners, not a good deal for the half of the population that rents. And and that's a big problem for a lot of the talking points that are made uh, for people that sleep outside. Uh, Mayor of Waltham loves, and this used to be more of a talking point a few years ago. I really haven't heard it much a little bit last year about the idea of people like busing their homeless to Waltham. Um, I used to hear that all the time. And it's such a gross thing. 
Uh, but you know, if you work in that community, if you talk to these people every day, uh, you realize that it's just mostly it's just people in Waltham that either you know had a series of losses, uh, got priced out, had a medical issue, and they're just on the street. They're just living on the street. They're living in the Bristol. They're just living on someone's couch. They're just trying to survive and trying to get back on their feet, which takes a really, really long time. And so uh, your point is it, not great for their talking points. Thank you for being that very informative. Oh, of course. I will say also, I was in communication with the mayor's office. Um, she responded to me when I provide a lot of data for the Better Bus Project. Um, the follow-up email, I started talking about the housing um, the housing law. She has not responded, so I do not have any uh, input in that. She has not given any further words. I'm not sure if that's why she has not responded. Um, but I did get the answer from the mayor's office for my first email. Uh, the email chain did not, did not continue after I brought that up, so she is trying to stay mom. Convenient. Yeah. <laughs> so the last thing we're going to talk about is an effort to stop a Lexington power plant. And Josh, you can take this away as well. Yeah. So there was, I saw it in a few places on social media this week. Um, and then it turned out there was a, a story about it on um, NECN um, about an effort to stop a power plant, um, which is proposed to be built. It would be in Lexington but on the Waltham line, it would be near the Cambridge Reservoir. Um, the NECN article was about someone who lives in that area. And he said, you know, I wanted to live here because there's so much green space here and now it's gonna be taken down um, for the power plant. So the main objection is that it's going to um, remove a lot of trees and take down um, a lot of green space. Um, so if I understand correctly, their ask is for people to contact the Lexington city government um, to ask them not to do this. What they people who are working on this may or may not know is that Waltham already tried to stop this project. Um, this is the same project we've talked about it on our show before where the plant is in Lexington, but they're going to have an access road that goes through Waltham and it went through a residential neighborhood. So initially the building inspector told them they couldn't do that um, because it's a residential neighborhood, it's not zoned for solar, and therefore you can't put a road for solar there. Um, the developers sued Waltham. Waltham went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court. There's a state law that says basically you have to allow solar plants and um, you can make reasonable restrictions on where they can go. And there's case law about what's considered reasonable. And Waltham uh, was arguing that solar is allowed in our industrial zones, so therefore it's reasonable to say this road can't go in a residential zone, but only about 2% of the city, less than 2% of the city is industrial. So the court ruled that was not reasonable. If Lexington tells these developers they can't do this, they will probably be sued and they will very likely lose because they'll have to give a reason. They'll have to go to court and say, yes, we allow solar plants, but there's a reason why this specific site is out that's not reasonable. The gentleman who they interviewed on NECN said, I'm not trying to stop the project. I'm just trying to get concessions that would make it less damaging to the environment. I'm not sure what those concessions would be, but that relies on Lexington having some leverage and they may have some leverage because this is in the papers. So, you know, the developer probably doesn't want to be the bad guy, but when it comes down to it, Lexington, I don't think can say no to this project. They don't have that leverage. So I think it's a good example of an issue that looks really different when you look at it on a local versus state level, sort of like the buses, like that's beautiful, almost untouched land over there. I'll be really sad to see it used for a solar plant. But the other side of it is we're getting our electricity now from a plant that was built somewhere that used to have trees and used to have wilderness. And, you know, if they were building the solar plant out in Western Mass, it would cut down just as many trees and displace just as many animals. There wouldn't be controversy if there were no people nearby. So they're they're saying, you know, this isn't a NIMBY thing because it's not we're, it's not about it being in our backyard. It's not exactly in our backyard. It's more about it taking away, trying to save this beautiful green space. Um, but 
every, you know, every plant and animal on the planet is affected by climate change. And if we need to, if we say we can only build solar plants, if they're not going to cut down trees or hurt the environment, that's holding them to a much higher standard than every other kind of power plant that's already been built. So when you look at it, I don't like the idea of those trees getting cut down, but I think when you look at it from the state's point of view, it really, there's no good way for Lexington to argue that that's a bad place. You know, that we have a beautiful residential community, we have a beautiful green space, but we don't also want a solar plant that could help preserve that for the future. We want that to go somewhere else. Unfortunately, I don't think they would have a very good case. I thought it was really funny. All the comments were literally spelling out NIMBY, like they were literally saying the words, I like this, just not in my backyard. Like they were just literally saying those words. I was like, well, the cognitive dissonance. And that's what the law, and in, in it seems like this new uh, MBTA communities law too, the people at the state level are trying to design laws to get around that, to make it so you can't say, oh, we want solar, we just don't like this one. Well, if you don't like this one, you might have to go to the state Supreme Judicial Court and explain why that's reasonable. This also reminds me of just like the city because of how it digs in its heels over stuff in, in oftentimes like arbitrarily like difficult is arbitrarily difficult about things then sets themselves up for failure like if they had been like actually like you know setting up areas for solar development and stuff in the city and making that a thing that could happen maybe this wouldn't be something that would be like getting rammed through right on our border. But, yeah, it's a, it's another example, sort of like the bus thing of a sort of an adversarial relationship between the state and the city, where it's like the state's trying to do something that they have good reason to do when you look at it on the state level and the city, is not the city government in, right now, but people in the city are saying, we need to stop this based on what it does. You know, it's a bad idea when we look at it strictly on the local level. And, you know, there's kind of this idea that, you know, and when it comes down to it, everybody who lives in a town also lives in the state, right? So the whole idea that the state interests should be that much different than city interests, that they should always be working against each other, that doesn't really make sense to me, but it, it has to do with your perspective, I guess. I could add a bit more just because it was shared with me a Facebook post, uh, one of the residents of that area who is sort of like leading the citizen charge against this. Um, they made a lot of interesting points, primarily of which uh, was the fact that they claimed, I'm not, I can't confirm this, but they claimed that the city of Cambridge was also against this development because yeah. it abuts a reservoir that is part of the Cambridge uh, yes. reservoir water supply. Um, and by like taking away the tree line, that could be bad for the water quality. Uh, but having but, Cambridge, are, oh, sorry, I think James, can, go ahead. I was, James. Gonna, I was gonna say the same thing. I think that Cambridge is gonna be switching to the NWRA, so they will no longer be using that as the reservoir. Uh, yeah, so. I thought that was interesting that that came up as a reason, because yeah, that's not gonna be a reason anymore. Right, I mean, it might note. be a concern. I don't know what happens when you drain a reservoir. It could be an environmental problem in other ways. But in terms of protecting the drinking water, that I don't know if that's a good argument for them to raise right now. That is good to know. Actually... That was the one argument they made. I was like, oh, shit, that's actually really bad. Um, <laughs> but okay. Because Are the they actually going to drain it? I, I, the only time I'd heard someone say draining it was in one of the, it, it was as a worst case scenario that they might drain it and put housing on there in one of the, uh, uh, one of the meetings for the master plan, but again, that kind of again reflects the catastrophizing of what the state will do if this if the city digs its heels in so hard that they have nowhere else but to put forty bees on an empty reservoir. You know. Okay, I think that'll do it for uh, this week's debrief episode. Um, thank you all for your input. Uh, I thought this was a lively discussion, um, and we will be back next week for the full city council debrief, uh, hoping for an interesting end of session meeting. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks Tom. Thank, Thank you. Bye.